recording. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for tuning in today. My name is Joyce from the DeYoung's social media team. Joining us today is Emma Acker, Associate Curator of the American Art Department at the DeYoung Museum. Hi, Emma. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. And thank you so much, Joyce, for asking me to join you today. Of course. So today's topic is the artist Richard Diebenkorn and the use of aerial perspective. I think today's viewers will really enjoy this presentation. First of all, Devin Korn is a beloved artist with roots here in the Bay Area and Northern California. And for you, Emma, his seawall painting, um, which we'll explore later, is one of your personal favorite paintings in our collection, right? Absolutely. Um, we'll be taking your questions um, through direct message because this is a pre-recording. So send us a message and we'll send them directly to Emma and get back to you promptly. So back to Devin Korn, you've described his paintings as meditative and restorative, which I think is something we're all in dire need of these days. I couldn't agree more. Um, these are such traumatic and uncertain times, and I really think that taking time to just focus on well-being and mental health is more important now than ever. And for me, connecting with art and nature are at the top of my list. I mean, my family uh, and I always make it a priority to get out on a hike at least once a weekend with our two little girls. We just went to Goldsworthy's Woodline um, this past weekend and my four-year-old daughter was in heaven because she got to kind of balance along the artwork the whole way. She said all her wishes had come true. So that made me feel good. Um, but I also just think it's so wonderful that you're giving our audiences this platform to experience our collections from afar. I think that's really restorative in itself. Thank you. And I know um, we've gotten so many great comments and messages from our visitors who've, been, who are visitors who've been watching for the past 21 weeks. So thank you guys for continuing to be with us each week. Um, so let's dive in or skydive in to today's topic and you can start your screen share. Great. Um, let me just cue this up and we'll be off to the races. Can you see everything? Looks fantastic, go ahead. Wonderful. Well, thank you all again so much for joining us. And as Joyce mentioned, I'm Emma Acker. I'm the Associate Curator of American Art at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. And it's really been a treat for me personally to take this time out of my daily routine to do this sort of deep dive into our permanent collection even if it is only virtually. Um, so in my talk today about the work of the pioneering American artist Richard Diebenkorn, I'm gonna focus on the really key role played by a sense of place and landscape in his art. I'm gonna focus in particular on the works that Diebenkorn made during his so-called Berkeley period between 1953 and 1966 when he produced abstract expressionist works, you see an example on the left, that really seemed to draw inspiration from the natural landscapes of the Bay Area, and then shifted to creating these psychologically powerful and resonant representational works, such as Seawall on the right. In both his abstract and figurative works of the Berkeley period, Diebenkorn used an aerial perspective to really strengthen the formal resonance of his compositions, but also to express his aesthetic and emotional responses to the unique climate and topography of the Bay Area. And this is a landscape that, as Joyce mentioned, he was really very deeply rooted in. Um, he was born in 1922 in Portland, Oregon, but he moved to San Francisco with his family when he was just two years old. There's a wonderful photo of him at left as a, as a boy. Um, he grew up in Ingleside Terraces. This is a residential neighborhood at the southern end of the city, just about two miles from the Pacific Ocean. He went to Lowell High School here in San Francisco, and then in 1940, he enrolled at Stanford University, um, and that's actually where he met his future wife, Phyllis. You see a lovely photograph of the two of them on their wedding day at Wright. Um, so Diebenkorn's father really wanted him to study medicine or law, but he rebelled in a sense by taking art courses during his third year at Stanford. He studied oil painting with Victor Arnatoff and drawing in watercolor with Daniel Mendelowitz. And Mandelowitz really introduced him to the work of early uh, 20th century masters such as Paul Cezanne, Henri Matisse, and Pablo Picasso. 
1943, they visited the Palo Alto art collection of Michael and Sarah Stein. And Michael uh, was the brother of the writer and art collector Gertrude Stein. And it was there that Diebenkorn saw Matisse's The Bay of Nice from 1918, which I'm showing you on the left, which has this very distinctive aerial perspective. And this is a viewpoint that really appears in later abstract works from Diebenkorn's Berkeley series, which we'll talk about in more depth in a moment. I'm um, including the work I'm showing you on the right, his Berkeley number 42 from 1955, which really seems to kind of reference the topography of the Bay Area. With Mendelowitz, Stephen Korn shared a passion for the work of Edward Hopper, and he particularly admired the way that Hopper was able to convey kind of the psychology and poetry of place. And on the left, I'm showing you an early untitled drawing by Diebenkorn from about 1944 or 45. We see this nighttime view of a deserted street and the rooftop and facade of this rectangular low-lying building. And it's got this unusual perspective, these strong contrasts of light and dark and very desolate subject matter that for me really link it to Hopper's Night Shadows from 1921, which I'm showing you on the right. Of course, Hopper's vantage is much more elevated, but in both works, the perspectives give the scenes a mysterious, melancholy, and even slightly sinister quality. Diebenkorn's drawing is probably based on a view of one of the barracks at either Quantico, Virginia, or Camp Pendleton, California, where he was stationed as a U.S. Marine between 1944 and 45. And it was during his years as a Marine that Diebenkorn actually worked as a cartographer, which gave him experience kind of um, doing these topographic surveys, depicting terrain in this very flattened, abstracted manner. Diebenkorn made these works while he was living in Sausalito. He lived there between 1947 and 1949. And you really feel in them a sense of the coastal topography of Northern California. And they have these kind of map-like qualities and landscape references that may stem from his earlier experiences as a cartographer. At left, I'm showing you a 19th century print by the Japanese artist Utagawa Hiroshige, and at right, a 20th century print by the American artist Yvonne Jaquette. Both works are in our collections. And as you can see from these examples, an aerial viewpoint tends to abstract forms into flattened planes of color and pattern. And as such, it really has a lot in common aesthetically with abstract expressionism, which is really the dominant stylistic influence on Diebenkorn's art from the mid 1940s until his shift to representation in 1955. Diebenkorn first became aware of abstract expressionism in 1945 after seeing reproductions of works by New York school artists such as Robert Motherwell and Jackson Pollock in an issue of Dime magazine. And at left, I'm showing you Pollock's The Moon Woman Cuts the Circle from 1943, which was reproduced in that issue. But his exposure to abstract expressionism was really heightened when in 1946 he enrolled at the California School of Fine Arts, which is now the San Francisco Art Institute, um, which had really become a kind of center on the West Coast for abstract expressionism with faculty that included Mark Rothko and Clifford Still. And I'm showing you Still in this photograph on the right, posing in front of two of his paintings. He was kind of a very um, outsized presence at the school. He had quite a large personality, and he was a particularly strict and dogmatic advocate for pure abstraction in art. The works from the period of time that Diebenkorn spent living in Albuquerque, New Mexico, between 1950 and 1952, when he was studying on the GI Bill at the University of New Mexico, getting his Master of Arts degree, really reflect the influence of abstract expressionist contemporaries, but they also suggest a kind of topographic survey. Paintings such as these were perhaps inspired by the elevated vantages and vistas that Diebenkorn could have experienced from Albuquerque's West Mesa, since they appear to be abstractions of landscapes viewed from on high. And they have these mostly earth-toned palettes that really evoke the dry, dusty terrain of the New Mexico desert. But Diebenkorn's perspective on the landscape was really forever changed. Uh, in the late spring or early summer of 1951, when he took his first daytime commercial flight, he traveled from, San, from, sorry, from Albuquerque to San Francisco to see an Arshiel Gorky retrospective at the San Francisco Museum of Art, which is now SFMOMA. 
And he described this experience as a kind of artistic epiphany. He recalled, quote, the airplane was a prop plane and it flew very low by today's standards. The pilot actually dipped down into the Grand Canyon so we could get a look at the scenery. And this was during a scheduled flight of a national airline. I guess it was the combination of desert and agriculture that really turned me on because it has so many things I wanted in my paintings. Of course, the Earth's skin itself had presence. I mean, it was all like a flat design and everything was usually in the form of an irregular grid. A bit later, I started photographing through airplane windows and actually got quite good results. And these images that I'm showing you here um, are slides taken in the early 1960s by Diebenkorn, uh, held by the Diebenkorn Foundation in Oakland, just across the bay. And they're probably the images that he referred to in that last quote, and they're really rather wonderful. From the air, the landscape appeared to Diebenkorn as a series of patchwork patterns, a network of lines shaping flat fields of color. Um, this is actually something that you may have experienced when looking out an airplane window. It's a pretty neat thing to do. I recommend it if you haven't done so already. You see the landscape in a whole new way. And Diebenkorn talked about the exhilaration that he experienced during this 1951 flight and its impact on his work recalling, quote, I was absolutely knocked out and thrilled, really taken. It wasn't that I went right to the canvas and said, I'm going to paint it, but it just went right into the mill and started coming out strong. And the work I'm showing you on the right from our collection, Miller 22, is from 1951, and it really shows that influence. So the painterly and improvisational compositions that Diebenkorn made after this flight incorporated his aerial impressions of fields, mesas, mountains, towns, and rivers. And I'm showing examples at left and center from his late Albuquerque period, and then at right from the year he spent living in Urbana, Illinois, which really evoke the sense of a built environment viewed from above. In September of 1953, after the year in Urbana and a summer in New York, Diebenkorn and his family moved back to the Bay Area. They rented a railroad style apartment in the Elmwood District, which is a residential neighborhood in Berkeley. And in many of the works from Diebenkorn's abstract Berkeley series, which he produced between the fall of 1953 and early 1956, he used an aerial viewpoint and the kind of energetic gestural energies of abstract expressionism to really evoke the kind of atmospheric and visual qualities of the Bay Area. So interestingly, at the time he made them, he characterized them as being, quote, purely abstract. But I think his title for the series is really no coincidence. It very explicitly links these works to the place where he made them. So early works in the series have these sort of beige tonalities that reflect the colors of the New Mexico landscape, including the work on the right from our collection, Berkeley number three, um, which has this mesa-like form in the upper register of the painting, which is really interesting. But Diebenkorn's palette became increasingly vibrant as the series progressed, and the brilliant jewel tones of paintings such as these really evoke the kind of lush green landscapes of Northern California. And the sense of landscape in these works is really enhanced by Diebenkorn's use of an aerial perspective, as in this intimately scaled and richly painted work from 1954, Berkeley number 33, which suggests a bird's eye vantage on a field bounded by a horizon or sea. You've got these layers of color and form that give a sense of spatial recession, but the visible traces of Diebenkorn's brushwork really emphasize the flatness of the picture plane. Look at this wonderful vertical line that he scraped down the center of the composition, just letting the ground of the canvas show through. And on the right, I'm showing you a detail of these kind of thick daubs of blue paint that are just encrusted on the surface of the canvas. So interestingly, critics of Diebenkorn's day frequently observed and commented on the landscape references in the abstract Berkeley works. One reviewer wrote in 1956 that they, quote, resemble aerial photographs of a big varied landscape with shoreline, mountains, cliffs, and fields, the contours, perhaps, of California. And I'm showing you on the left a page from a 1957 article in Life magazine showing Diebenkorn posing with his painting Berkeley Number no. 44 from 1955. And in the article, the painting is described as recalling, quote, the sweeping patterns of the fertile lands north of San Francisco. 
Although the paintings in the Berkeley series were deeply influenced by abstract expressionism, as we've seen, the references to the natural world that they contain connected Diebenkorn to local artistic traditions, such as the Bay Area figurative movement. And this was really boldly kicked off in late 1949 or early 1950, when the artist David Park, um, I'm showing you a portrait of Park by Diebenkorn on the left, deposited his abstract expressionist canvases at the Berkeley dump and abruptly shifted to painting in a representational mode. And on the right, I'm showing you the first painting, uh, representational painting that Park exhibited publicly, his rehearsal. So at a time when abstraction really reigned supreme, both in New York and San Francisco, Park's move to figuration was viewed as radical and even treasonous. But for him and for artists who followed in his stead like Diebenkorn, it was really liberating, um, allowing him to kind of reconcile the gestural energies of abstract expressionism with figurative subject matter, which was so interesting and appealing to these artists. And even though he was continuing to work in a predominantly abstract mode, in the fall of 1953, Diebenkorn began weekly studio visits and drawing sessions from the model with Park and Elmer Bischoff and later Frank Lobdell. So he sketched figures during these sessions, but he also made drawings featuring still lives, interior scenes, and landscape. And he later noted about these experiences, quote, the seeds of what was to happen to me were in those figure drawing sessions. And in 1955, despite the fact that there was so much critical acclaim around the abstract works in his Berkeley series, Diebenkorn began to feel really disenchanted and disillusioned with abstract expressionism. He described it as a stylistic straitjacket, and he began searching for ways for his ideas, quote, to be worked on, changed, altered by what was out there, as he said. And it was in the late fall of that year that he produced what he's described as his first representational painting, the small oil on canvas I'm showing you on the right, Chabot Valley. And we can see that it represents an urban or a suburban landscape. It's got a recognizable subject matter, but the paint handling is so thick and loose and energetic, just as in Diebenkorn's abstract paintings. So you really see this uh, influence of abstract expressionism continuing to pervade these works. And it was after making this painting that Diebenkorn shifted to working in a predominantly representational mode, which really sent shockwaves through the art world. I think the most dramatic example of an aerial perspective in Diebenkorn's figurative work is Seawall from 1957, which you see here, which really shows his ability to kind of seamlessly merge um, the kind of stylistic qualities of abstract expressionism, such as surface richness and emphasis on the formal properties of paint and canvas with representational subject matter. And as Joyce mentioned, this is truly one of my favorite paintings in the American art collection at the De Young. It has been for many years now. Um, it's small in scale, but it really has this tremendous visual power, this kind of visceral immediacy. You feel its presence from across a gallery and I really miss seeing it in person and look forward to the time when I can reunite with it. Um, Diebenkorn painted this work in his studio, but it's probably based on his memories of a trip he took up the Northern California coast. And he's managed to convey the sort of freshness and vibrancy of a clear day in the Bay Area as though he were painting on plein air. And the aerial viewpoint that he used really heightens our sensory and emotional impressions of this really elemental meeting of sea, sky, and earth. From the lofty vantage, the landscape below resembles a kind of patchwork of abstract forms, just as the landscape appeared to Diebenkorn as a flat design when he was traveling from Albuquerque to San Francisco. So we see this kind of complex jigsaw-like pattern of forms and colors on the left, which really contrasts with this wide swath of almost scribbled green grass at right. Diebenkorn's painted this section very loosely, um, allowing the ground of the canvas to show through his thin brushwork. He may have even used a palette knife to scrape away layers of paint. And you can see he's roughly scratched in this track of two parallel white lines at lower right, which resembles a kind of path or a trail, which you would expect to find in an area where people are, are hiking. Um, and it leads the viewer's eye upwards and outside the confines of the picture plane. So again, kind of brings us back to his um, sort of brushwork uh, traces of his 
uh, artistic process, this sensuous and varied paint handling that really kind of reflects his assertion that, quote, one wants to see the artifice of the thing as well as the subject. Reality has to be digested. It has to be transmuted by paint. It has to be given a twist of some kind. And here I think it really bears mentioning the work of one of Stephen Korn's contemporaries, another California-based artist, a kind of hometown hero, Wayne Tebow, uh, another favorite artist of mine, who also incorporated aerial viewpoints into his work quite frequently. Um, and in his kind of vertiginous streetscapes, such as the one I'm showing you on the left from our collection, Diagonal Freeway, um, he kind of conveys an almost humorous and cartoonish sense of exuberance, but also these dizzyingly surreal vantages really give a sense of the precariousness, fragility, and even absurdity of human existence. And this is something I think we can all really relate to right now. So like Thibaut, Diebenkorn used an elevated viewpoint to abstract his urban subject in Cityscape Number 1 from 1963. Here we see a hilly residential street, probably in San Francisco, which rises sharply up toward the horizon line. And like Seawall, it reads as a landscape but it can also be experienced as a highly formal arrangement of contrasting patterns and tones, this series of self-contained painterly abstractions. Look at these powerful juxtapositions of color and form that really give the painting its dynamism, like the contrast between these kind of tightly clustered squat buildings on the left, and then these broad planes of color that he's used to describe the fields and vacant lots on the right side of the composition. Diebenkorn even introduced a note of menace and drama with the blade-like forms of the sweeping shadows that the buildings cast across the street. Um, and uh, there's this wonderful way in which they're sort of reaching out across the landscape. And I'm showing you on the right his cityscape number three from the same year, where he's enlarged and simplified a portion of the scene he depicted in cityscape number one. And you can see that it results in this much sparer, even more abstracted composition. Interestingly, many of Diebenkorn's still lives incorporate an aerial view. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful sort of uh, sense of the continuity of this motif across all different genres of his art. Um, and in these compositions, everyday objects are dispersed across dramatically tilted tabletops, like actors on a stage or landscape elements that are kind of spread out across terrain. At left, I'm showing you a photograph by Morley Bear in Diebenkorn's house in the Berkeley Hills, which has a similar viewpoint and also features many of the same objects that show up in Diebenkorn's print on the right. The format of these compositions also reflects the influence of European modernists such as Cezanne and Matisse, as well as of the Indian Rajput miniatures that Diebenkorn admired and actually collected, which often feature unusual viewpoints and very dramatically flattened compositions. Stephen Korn's interest in the aerial view lasted throughout his lifetime, and it seems to have influenced the abstract works in his Ocean Park series, which he produced beginning in 1967. These very spare architectonic compositions really evoke the distinctive light and grid-like geometries of the neighborhood where he lived in Santa Monica. And the painting I'm showing you on the left, Ocean Park 116, is from our collection. The abstractions from Diebenkorn's Lower Colorado series from 1969 to 70 are very clearly based on views he took of the Western landscape from a helicopter, and they evoke a sense of shifting desert terrain. These works were commissioned in 1969 by the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, who asked some 40 artists, among them Norman Rockwell and Ralston Crawford, to depict images of water projects in the American West. So for the commission, Diebenkorn traveled to the Salt River and Lower Colorado River basins in Arizona, and he looked at the landscape from a high mesa as well as from a helicopter. And he took aerial photographs during these trips, including the one I'm showing you at left, which have these strong diagonals and abstracted geometries that appear in some of the works in the series, as you can see in the example at right. As Diebenkorn said, quote, I think the many paths or path-like bands in my paintings may have something to do with this experience, especially in that wherever there was agriculture going on, you could see process, ghosts of former tilled fields, patches of land being eroded. Stephen Korn said in a 1992 interview, quote, I'm a very impressionable person, and I think the landscape will sometimes lead me to something. It usually has. 
So using the aerial view really let Diebenkorn kind of incorporate some of the formalist principles of modernist abstraction into his art, but still to very poetically convey his visual, sensory, and emotional impressions of his surroundings. So I'm gonna stop my share. I just had to unmute myself. Wow, that was so much fun. I really enjoyed um, your presentation today. I especially enjoyed um, the zoomed in details that we may have overlooked if we're looking at them in person. So that was really interesting. And as soon as this pandemic's over, I'm gonna hop off a plane and pray I get a window seat so I can <laughs> have the same perspective as Stephen Korn. Yeah, it's a really neat experience. I, I think I had actually, looked out the window that way before getting interested in this topic. Um, but I definitely, you know, now really zero in on those views that um, take off and landing now. Yeah, you can't unsee it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now that you, and especially, now, especially now that you've broken it down for us. Um, so before we log off today, um, can you let our visitors know what you and the American Art Department have been working on since our closure? Absolutely. Well, as always, we're working on exhibition projects, um, which I can't really share because they're um, in the development phase, but it's great to have the opportunity to really kind of dive into that kind of long term um, work and planning. Uh, additionally, we've really been taking a closer look at our permanent collection wall labels, um, the didactics that we present to our visitors, because we want to really make sure that they uh, respond to and reflect the urgent conversations that we're having across the nation right now and make our objects as relevant and meaningful and accessible to audiences as possible so that when we welcome them back physically into the building, um, they'll have a refreshed lens on um, these collections. And we've also been meeting uh, frequently on Zoom and been using a lot of technology lately, not, not in-person meetings just yet, um, but with colleagues from other departments to um, really brainstorm ideas for ways that we can, as an institution, um, really join the important conversations that are happening right now um, and reflect them in the way that we present our collections and special exhibitions. So it's been a great opportunity for us all, I would say. That's great. And I know that we as an institution really look forward to sharing this progress that we're making with our with our visitors and our members soon. Yeah, we can't wait. <laughs> um, it was really wonderful speaking with you today. Thank you for taking the time to share this story about Richard, Richard Diebenkorn. And I hope everyone who watched got even a little bit of peace and tranquility from these beautiful images. Well, thank you so much, Joyce. It was really a pleasure. And I hope that our viewers enjoyed seeing the beautiful California landscape through Richard Diebenkorn's eyes. Totally. Um, so thanks to everyone who watched from home. We'll see you again next time. Bye.